we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. When the brain is quiet in sleep, rejuvenation of its whole structure takes place and a quality of innocence comes into being. Hello and welcome to episode 135 of Urgency of Change. Season 3 of the Krishnamurti podcast continues with the format of carefully chosen extracts from the philosopher's talks. Each weekly episode focuses on a theme explored by Krishnamurti and the aim is to represent his different approaches to these universal topics. This week's theme is Sleep and Dreams. Upcoming themes are the future, the observer, and effort. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. Please visit our official YouTube channels for hundreds of advert-free, full-length video and audio recordings of Krishnamurti's talks and clips. You can also find our daily quotes and videos on Instagram and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoy the podcast, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, which helps our visibility. This week's episode on sleep and dreams has four sections. This first extract is from Krishnamurti's second talk at Brockwood Park in 1969, titled Can We Understand Ourselves by Analyzing Our Dreams? I think one of our major problems is to be sensitive. A sensitive not only to one's own uh, idiosyncrasies and fallacies and and troubles, but also to be sensitive of others. And more and more one lives in this mechanical world, in this world of very little meaning. The job, the success, the competition, the ambition, the social status, the prestige and all that does make for insensitivity to the danger to the psychological dangers. One is aware of the danger of insecurity, physical insecurity, not having enough money, proper health, clothes and shelter and so on. One is fairly sensitive about all that. And one has naturally to be sensitive, but inwardly the whole psychological structure of our souls, one is hardly aware of the structure of oneself. And there one feels one lacks great finesse, sensitivity, intelligence to deal with the, with the psychological inward problems.
Please don't be so solemn. Huh? Please, I am not a preacher. Sitting in a platform doesn't give me any authority. And please don't treat this as a a means of letting off your emotional states, getting devoted and emotional, sentimental about the person sitting on the platform. That has no value at all. So, what we are saying is, why is it that we are not aware of the psychological dangers as we are of the physical dangers? We are aware of the pitfalls, precipices, poison, snake, wild animal, or we are aware of the war, of the destructive nature of it outwardly. Why is it that we are not completely aware inwardly of all the psychological dangers in which we live? Like nationalism, the danger of conflict within oneself, the danger of ideologies, concepts, formulas, the danger of accepting authority of any kind, the danger of this constant battle between human beings, however closely, intimately they are related. Why aren't we aware of all that danger? And if some of us are aware of those dangers, how do we deal with them? Either we escape from them, suppress them, or try to forget them, or leave it to time to resolve them. We do all this because we don't know what to do. Or, as we are very people who have read a great deal, we try to apply what others have said. So there is never a direct contact with the problem, with the psychological danger directly. It's always through somebody or try to overcome it, suppress it, try to force ourselves to understand it. It's never a, a direct look, a direct communion with the issue. And of course there are the whole modern structure of psychology and the psychologists and the analysts who tell us what we are. Study the animal and you will understand yourself better. We are the result of the animal, obviously, but we have to understand ourselves, not through the animal, but or through Freud or Jung or all these specialists, but actually what we are. Understand it not through somebody's eyes, but with our own eyes, with our own heart, with our own mind. And when we do that, we all sense of following another, all sense of authority comes to an end. 
and I think that's very important, then we do something directly for its own sake, not because somebody else tells us. And I think that is the beginning of what it means to love. So can we be aware or become sensitive to the dangers psychologically to the dangers that we have so carefully cultivated. And when we do become aware of them, how do we deal with them? Are they dissolved through analysis? through introspection? Do we understand the dangers through the psychoanalytical process, whether done by a professional or by yourself, do those dangers disappear? Does time dissolve them? or escaping from them dissolve them, suppressing, transmuting, or thinking about something quite different, because you are bored with all this business. If analysis is not the way, analysis implies, did we go through all that? All right. Analysis implies the analyzer, whether it is a professional analyzer, the analyst, with his background, with his knowledge, with his particular idiosyncrasies, Jungian or Freudian or some other modern uh, expert, he is conditioned, as the analyzed is also conditioned. If the professional does not help us to completely dissolve the psychological danger in which we live, then what is one to do? <coughs> if analysis is not the way, because that involves time, and if you analyzed yourself very, very carefully, step by step, your analysis must be so free, without any prejudice, without any bias, and each experiment, each testing must be so complete, so free, that the next analysis must be must not carry over the knowledge of the past. Otherwise you are using that knowledge to examine the present, and therefore you are using that which is dead to understand that which is living. I hope you see all this. And that involves time. And if, if one 
has to analyze everything every day when hasn't the time the energy and perhaps we may be able to do it the end of one's life but then life is finished and perhaps one says to oneself i'll understand myself through my dreams probably most of us do dream a great deal and it is said unless you dream you may go mad and i have been experimenting i have been told not that i am a reader of any of these things that through experiments i have found that dreaming is a necessary part of existence and one says to oneself does one understand oneself through dreams again they need interpretation <coughs> and who is to interpret them the professional or yourself if you interpret them they must be interpreted very very correctly truly and they are you capable of doing it? and one ask is it necessary to dream at all perhaps that may open up a totally different avenue if one questions the necessity of dreaming because of troll during the day there are all the strains and stresses the ugly quarrels the nagging the fears the bullying of the other and so on there is this constant conscious everyday struggle and perhaps when one goes to sleep why should these struggles continue sleep may have a totally different meaning altogether i think it has so that the brain which has been so active protecting itself thinking uh, planning uh, struggling throughout the day that brain when it goes to sleep why should be why should it continue its activity why can't it rest completely so that when it wakes up the next morning it is rejuvenated it's fresh young and not burdened so when the during the sleep when the brain is completely quiet i don't know if you have experimented with it if you have not according to the expert but for yourself if you have gone into it sufficiently deeply i'm sure you'll have found that there are, that a brain so quiet so relaxed so extraordinarily alert and orderly comes to a different state altogether I think sleep 
has great significance in that way. But if that sleep is a constant process of thought, constant movement and reaction of the brain, then that sleep is a, is a disturbance, and in that there is no rest. So, is it possible not to dream at all, knowing that unless there is order in daily existence, then it must dream. Because that is the way of an intimation of the unconscious. So can the brain be so awake during the day so free to examine, to observe all its reactions? It's conditioning. its fears, its motives, its anxieties, its guilt. So free to observe and not suppress it, not avoid it, so that during the day there is order. Because at I don't know again. Do you, are you interested in all this? Because of sleep? Or are you going to experience something miraculous? Or read some nirvanic plane or Buddhist, whatever it is? This is extraordinarily interesting if you go into this. If you do it yourself, not let somebody else do it for you. You know, unless there is order, the brain is disturbed. That is, the neurotic state. Because the disordered life is a neurotic state. And the more it is disordered, the more the dreams, the tension and all the rest of it goes on. So the brain demands order. Because in order there is security. If the animal is constantly be uh, shaken, mo- uh, given, uh, is disturbed, has no security, it'll obviously go mad also. So the brain demands order, not order according to a design to a blueprint, or the order which society says is order. What society says is order is disorder. So the brain needs order to be completely secure, and it must be secure, not in the sense that it must resist, guard, uh, isolate itself, but it is only secure, orderly, when there is tremendous understanding. Of 
or otherwise when you go to sleep there is a great deal of disturbance. And so the brain tries to put things in order as you are sleeping. And dreams, analysis, time doesn't solve our psychological dangers and problems. Time being postponement. Time is involved when there is the fact and the idea what should be, the distance between the fact and what should be, in that there is time involved, I will eventually become good, or I will be something, all that involves time. And when there is time, when thought creates time, it brings about disorder. Time is actually a postponement, a form of laziness. But you don't have time or use time or say, I will act later on when you see act physical danger in front. You act immediately. So please, for, so time, analysis, dreams or any form of escape and suppression or sublimation, or conflict with the problem doesn't solve the problem. Right? Then what is one to do? I do not know if you have faced the problem that way. That is, through negation, face the issue. Because we have said, analysis is not the way, because we have understood what is implied in it. We have, we have looked at it very carefully, not because somebody says analysis is not the way, but we have examined, we have experimented with it, we have observed it. Therefore, we have, that we have put it aside. So, through negation of what is considered the positive, we can then face the fact. Now, am I, is my mind, my whole being prepared to put aside this whole technique of analysis? introspection and all that, completely. And in that a great deal is involved, still more, because most of us live in the past. We are the past. What happened yesterday shapes the present, and so tomorrow. We are being reborn every day in the shadow of yesterday. And whether 
the mind, the brain can be made fresh. And that in that also there is the whole process of analysis involved. find out for oneself where memory and the action of memory is necessary, which is the past, and where it is totally unnecessary and dangerous. The second extract is from the second talk at Brockwood Park in 1972, titled The Mind Tries to Create Order Through Dreams. Then will dreams teach. We are asking this question because we are trying to expose the unconscious bring it all out, the content, because the content makes the consciousness, right? The house is what it contains, and it contains so much, so many contradictions, so many in so much information, you know, it's a jumbo, and therefore utterly confused. Will dreams clear the basic fear of existence, basic fear of not being? not becoming, not fulfilling, not trying to achieve. And what are dreams? Well, one has to learn about all this. Please, not from me. Because you dream. Why do you dream? pleasant or unpleasant dreams, nightmares and so on. Why do you dream at all? The experts say you must dream, because otherwise you'll go insane. Probably that's true, because dreams try to bring about order, right? Indicate that there is disorder. Let's put it that way better. Dreams indicate that there is disorder. And during the day you are unconscious of your disorders, because you are caught up in so much activity, chattering, talking, you know, doing, going to the office and quarrelling and bullying and all the rest of it that goes on. During the day you are you are caught in a routine which breeds disorder, and one is not aware of it. And during the night, when you sleep, dreams are the continuation of that disorder in which the mind is trying to bring order. Right? I do not know if you have not noticed that if you bring order out of disorder, that is, understand disorder, not superimpose upon disorder what you think is order, but if you understand order, disorder, out of that comes order. And the brain needs order. Then it can function well, it is protected. 
and order gives it tremendous security. Then it can function beautifully. So, in dreams, the mind is trying to bring about order. But if during the day you have, you, you are aware of the disorder, and because you are aware there is order, then you will find that sleep becomes quite a different thing. then the mind is quiet, the brain is quiet, it's not everlastingly working, working, working. You're following all this? Learn, please learn. <laughs> so that the brain is quiet, refreshed, young, and therefore clear, and it can meet the day afresh, because it has established order, out of this order. The third extract is from Krishnamurti's fourth talk in San Diego, 1970, titled Attention During Sleep. The waking mind, the mind that's awake during the day, functioning along the lines in which it has been trained, and the conscious mind, with all its daily activities, continues during sleep, the same activities. Have you noticed it? In most of the dreams there is action going on, some kind or another, some happening which is the same as in daily living, right? So your sleep is a continuation of the waking hours. Are you following all that? Are you getting tired at the end of the talk? I'm surprised you are not tired. You must have had a hard day, and this is not an entertainment, this is real work, work that you have never done before, therefore it must be exhausting. So sleep is a continuation of the waking hours. And we give a lot of mysterious hocus-pocus to dreams. And then these dreams need to be interpreted. And you have all the professionals interpreting the dreams for you. Which you can yourself can observe very simply if you watch your own life, your own life during the daytime. So the question is, why should the mind, why should there be dreams at all? Though the psychologists say, from what they have told us, that you must have dreams, otherwise you will go insane. But when you have observed very closely your waking hours and all the activities, the self-centered, the fearful, the anxious, the guilty, you know, watching it, attentive all day, then you will say that when you go to sleep, you sleep. 
You have no dreams. Because you have, during the day, you have watched every movement of thought. The mind has been watching, attentive to every word. You work it out, you will see the beauty of it. Not the tars, 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 not the boredom of watching, but the beauty of watching. So, when the mind is attentive during the day, then there is attention in sleep. I'm afraid this, you, it doesn't matter whether you understand or not, I'll go on. Because somebody someday will understand this. <laughs> and it's important to understand it, because, you see, conscious mind, the mind that is daily attentive, watching itself, cannot possibly touch something entirely different. Though in sleep it is attentive. And that's why meditation, the thing that we have talked about during this hour, becomes extraordinarily important and worthwhile full of dignity, grace and beauty, when you understand attention, not only during waking hours, but also during sleep, then the whole of the mind is totally awake. And beyond that, Every form of description is not the described. Therefore, don't talk about it. All that one can do is point to the door. And if you are willing to go, take a journey to that door, it's for you to walk. Beyond that, nobody can describe the thing that is not nameable. Whether that nameable is nothing or everything doesn't matter. Anybody who describes it doesn't know. And who, one who says he knows does not know. The final extract in this episode is from the seventh talk in Sarnen, 1970, titled Can the Brain Be Completely Quiet in Sleep? One has to have very good, healthy, sane body. And therefore, a brain that is capable of thinking rationally, healthily, objectively, non-impersonally, therefore efficiently, and a brain that is absolutely quiet, not mechanically made quiet, Now you can see the truth of this, can't you? Huh? The, tr the simple fact of it, that one needs to have a very good, healthy, sensitive, alert body, a brain that functions very clearly, non-emotionally, non-personally, and such a brain to be absolutely quiet, 
You can see the fact of that, the simple logical fact of it. Now, how is this to be brought about? Do you understand what I mean? How can the brain, which is so tremendously active, not only during the daytime but when you all go to sleep, how can this brain be so completely relaxed and completely quiet? You understand my question? No method will do it, obviously. Please follow all this. No method, right? Do you see that? Huh? Because method implies mechanical repetition, which stupefies the brain and therefore makes the brain dull, and you, in that dullness you think you have marvellous experiences. So how is this brain, which is so tremendously active, which is never still, because it's always chattering to itself or with others, judging, evaluating, liking, disliking, you know, turning over all the time. How can that brain be completely still? You understand the importance of a brain being still. The importance, not what the speaker says is important. For yourself, do you see the really importance, the, impo- the extraordinary importance impo- that this brain should be completely quiet? Because the moment it acts, it can only act in response of the past. It can only act in terms of thought. And therefore, again, the operation of the past. And it's only such a brain that completely can still can observe. Right? One can observe a cloud, a tree, a flowing river with fairly quiet brain. Right? You can see those mountains, the extraordinary light on those mountains. And the brain can be completely still. You have noticed this, haven't you? Now, how has that happened? How does the mind, facing something of of extraordinary magnitude, like a very, very, very complex machinery, like a a marvellous computer, or a magnificent sunset or a mountain, how does it become completely quiet for even a split second? <coughs> Have you noticed when you give a child a good toy, how the toy absorbs the child? Then the child is concerned with it, playing with it, and doesn't, you know, is absorbed by the toy. In the same way, the mountain, the beauty of a tree, the flowing waters absorb the minds and mix the mind by its greatness still. Right? That is, the brain is made still by something. Now, is there, can the brain be 
required without an outside factor entering into it. You are following all this? And because they haven't found the way, therefore they say, grace of God, prayers, right? Faith, absorption in Jesus, in this or in that. And we see all that, this absorption by something outside, can be uh, dull, a stupefied mind can do this. We are trying to find out can this happen, this quiet, free, brain that, that is completely quiet, without any interference. Right? You have understood the question? If it is not quiet, one of the factors is dream. You are you following all this? Is this too much? Topi, if you don't understand, it's up to you. The brain is active all day, endlessly. The moment it wakes up till it goes to sleep, it is on the move. And when they when you go to bed and go to sleep, the activity of the brain is still going on, right? The activity of the brain is, is dream, our dreams, right? The same movement during the, of the day is carried on during sleep. And therefore, the brain has never a rest. Never a moment it says, I finished. It's over. As it's carrying on the problems which it has accumulated into sleep, and when you wake up, those problems go on. It's a vicious circle. So, a brain that has to, is to be quiet must have no dreams at all. Because when the mind is quiet during sleep, you, the, the brain is quiet during sleep, there is a totally different quality entering into the, into the brain, into the mind. We'll go into that a little later, if you are interested in it. So, we are asking, how does it happen that the brain, which is so tremendously, eagerly, enthusiastically active, can naturally, easily, without any effort and suppression, be quiet? I said to you. As we said during the day, it is active, endless. Moment you wake up, you look out at the window and say, Oh, awful rain. Oh, it's a marvelous, lovely morning, but too hot. You've, cha you've started. At that moment, when you look out of the window, not to say a word, not suppressing words, not to realize that by 
saying what a lovely morning, what a horrible rain, this or that, the mind has start, the brain has started. But if you watch out of the window and not say a word, which doesn't mean you suppress the word, just to observe, with all the memory of the past rushing, just to observe. Right? So there you have the clue, there you have the key to observe without the old brain responding. Therefore, when the old brain doesn't respond, there is a quality of the new mind, new brain coming into being. Uh, are you getting all this? You can observe the hills, the mountains, the river, the sh valleys, the shadows, the lovely trees, and the marvelous cloud with full of light and glory beyond the mountains. To look at it without a word, without comparing. But it becomes much more difficult when you look at your neighbour, at your wife, your husband, your another person. There you are already got the images established, and it becomes much more difficult to observe your wife, your husband, your neighbour, your politician, your priest, whatever it is, absolutely without an image, just to observe. And you will see when you so observe, so clearly see, the action becomes extraordinarily vital. Therefore it becomes a complete action, which is not carried over the next minute. You are meeting this? You understand? One has problems. not sleeping well, quarrelling with wife, you know, problems, deeply, superficially. And we carry these problems from day to day, dreams, uh, the repetition of these problems, the repetition of fear, pleasure, the problem over and over and over and over again, that obviously stupefies the mind makes the mind dull, brain too. Now, is it possible to end the problem as it arises? You understand? Not carry it over. I have a problem, somebody has insulted me. Hmm? I'm taking the most silly problem. At that moment, the old brain responds instantly. Right? Saying, You're also. Now, before the old brain responds, to be aware of what the man or woman has said, uh, something which is unpleasant, to have an interval between what he has said and the response of the old brain, to have a gap. You understand this? <clears throat> so that the old brain is, is responding slowly, doesn't immediately jump into the battle. So if you watch during the day the movement of thought in action, thought is action, and if you watch that and you realise that it is breeding problems 
and problems are something which are incomplete, which had to be carried over. But if you watch that, with a brain that is fairly quiet, then you will see action becomes instantaneous. So there is no carrying over of a problem. You, you got this? No carrying over the insult or the praise or something, you know, problem, carrying over the next minute. It's finished. So when you go to when, the, when there is sleep, the brain is no longer carrying on the old activities of the day. It's, it has complete rest. Right? And therefore the brain then being quiet in sleep, that takes place not only rejuvenation of the whole structure in itself, but a quality of innocency comes into being. Because only the innocent mind can see what is truth, right? Not the complicated mind, not the philosopher, not the priest, not the brain that is constantly repetitive mechanical. Innocent mind is the brain as well as the body, the mind, the whole, whole entity, not ent- the whole being, not even the being, it's that whole thing in which the body, the heart, the brain, the, mind, the whole of that, if, you do, if there is this, pro- this alertness, watchfulness during the day, And when there is sleep, there is a certain quality of innocency that happens. And it is only this innocent mind, which has never been touched by thought, it's only such an innocent mind that can see what is truth, what is reality, if there is something beyond measure. That is meditation, not all the phony stuff. Therefore, to find, to come upon this extraordinary beauty of Truth with its ecstasy, you must lay lay the foundation The foundation is the understanding of thought which breeds fear and sustains pleasure. The understanding of order and therefore virtue. And therefore the freedom from all conflict and aggression and brutality, violence, that is the foundation, without that you can play tricks. And what you will have are the tricks of the conjurer. But once one has laid this foundation on freedom, then there is this sensitivity which is supreme intelligence, And from that the whole life one leads becomes entirely different.